The following is a conversation with Tim Butcher, someone who for me embodies the romantic ideal of a traveling journalist and war correspondent. There are some people who are just predisposed to podcasting. Tim Butcher is without a doubt one of them. And as you will see, he speaks effortlessly in an almost finished prose. It reminds me of these interviews and videos with Christopher Hitchens that I have listened to within an inch of their life. And I think that there is something to the international journalists' high writing cadence and British expectations for illusory and ironic inflection at every corner that just crafts this storytelling knack and ability to speak so eloquently, quite frankly. But this intro is going to be a tad longer than usual, uh, but please don't skip it because it will inform some of the context for the conversation that then precedes it. Tim Butcher, the guest on the show, he served as a journalist for over 20 years with the Daily Telegraph newspaper in the United Kingdom. He held a series of positions there, including lead writer, war correspondent, African bureau chief, and Middle East correspondent. Tim was reporting from the front lines, as they say, although I do think in this case, literally as well, um, for if not all, at least some of the Yugoslav wars, which were a series of separate but related ethnic conflicts, wars of independence and insurgencies fought in the former Yugoslavia, which is Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia, this part of the world from 1991 to 2001. And I think it's worth mentioning that here because there is a wonderful anecdote that Tim told me of riding a tank to the peak of Mount Igman that dominates the cityscape of Sarajevo with his former comrade, former colleague, and now fellow guest on this podcast, the great and powerful Tim Marshall, author of Prisoner and Power of Geography, which if you're interested, there is a, a several interviews that you can see in the backlog to listen to him. But I mentioned this preamble of his history writing from the Yugoslav Wars because it is what happens after this conflict, which is what dominates our conversation today. Because Tim conducted what is surely one of the greatest adventures of the 21st century. Now, longtime listeners of the podcast know very well how interested, I, how interested I am in the great adventurers of history. Episode 55 with Scott Rank is almost exclusively about this topic. The first, epi- the first half of the episode 60 with Rudy Lynch, Von Humboldt, James Holman, Percival Fawcett, and hundreds of unnamed people whose journeys and adventures were never recorded. I find it all very, very romantic. The great journeys of ancient Egypt into Scandinavia. The great Aboriginal who walked through Asia. The Mayan who ventured north to live among the Apaches. I am very fascinated by these types. And there is an idea that this type of adventure is inaccessible to us in the 21st century. Well, it is true that there are no longer great lands like Australia that could be explored as part of the new world. And although exploration like that is likely finito on this planet, and don't tell me to go and explore the oceans because I can't breathe there, but great adventurers and truly great adventures are still capable to anyone bold and organized enough to go for them. I am thinking of the great Australian, Tim Cope, who in 2004 traveled 10,000 kilometers on horseback throughout the Eurasian steppe. Or Robin Davidson, another great Australian who tamed camels and crossed one of the largest deserts in the world on foot. I can only name two and I cannot think of any more, though I'm sure there are, but someone who slots very neatly into this category of the modern adventurer is my guest today, Mr. Tim Butcher. Because he traveled overland, the great, powerful, all-consuming, hostile lungs of the earth, which is the territory we know as the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what makes this one of the great adventures of the 21st century is that at the time he did it, at the time he did it, it had been over a hundred years since someone else had successfully made the journey, and it's very likely that since no one has. Because unlike the rest of the world, the hundred-year interlude between the previous adventurer and then Tim Butcher. The interlude had made things worse in the Congo rather than better. I remember during my economics degree at university, we had to start changing the definition of countries from first, second, and third world to developed, developing, and underdeveloped. Well, they need another definition for the Congo because it does not neatly fit into one of these three categories because the Congo is undeveloping. They are an undeveloped, undeveloping economy. The rate of progress by all these arbitrary measures is on decline. And such was this, the state of affairs in 2004, when Tim made this journey through the Congo. What he sees, experiences, feels, and then learns throughout the journey is impossible to capture in a succinct manner via a podcast, although we do try to give it a go. But make sure, even if you have just a peripheral interest in Africa, but especially the Congo, go and consume the book and the journey entailed. All right, everyone, 
Thank you for bearing with me through that. This is That is the conclusion of my overindulgent introduction. Now just the compulsory stuff to benefit your listening. In the chat, we cover, Tim and I, the risks of the Congo, the beauty of the Congo, Tim explaining why progress is inverted in the Congo. Sadly, some of the corruption and kleptocracy of the Congo, Africa, and more broadly. But then finally, Tim offers us a worldview into his mind and his current project, his attempt and understanding of what makes a nation and then the nationalism that goes along with it. I think a magnum opus, which I'm very looking forward to seeing. And as usual, there are timestamps, but as I started with, <clears throat> some people are just predisposed for podcasting. Tim is certainly one of them. So just sit back and enjoy the yarn. Hang around to the end for my afterthoughts and also for me to explain to you, my very generous and dear listener, my ambition for the podcast. And with that, we close what is potentially the longest introduction of all time. Here is the magnificent Tim Butcher. Tim Butcher, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon, mate. How are you? I'm good, and I owe you an apology. You've been hunting me these last few months, but COVID got in the way, and I'm sorry for for messing you around and leaving emails on things. You're a very determined guy, so your podcast <laughs> listeners uh, uh, will benefit from that. When I could assure you, when he gets his teeth into someone, he ain't going to let him go. <laughs> well, thanks for saying, Tim. Uh, I'm happy to see that everything was okay, because there was a second there where I was a bit worried. Oh, shit, maybe I should really stop... Uh, following up with this guy because anyway we're going to kick off with blood river um let's start with the geography of the journey uh because you were retracing the steps of hm stanley in 1871 who traveled overland of the congo can you describe to me and the audience why traveling overland of the congo isn't like walking or traveling overland like anywhere else you're not walking the coast of spain you're not crossing mexico you're not you're not even crossing South Africa or Botswana, you're crossing the, the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's a very serious ordeal that has very legitimate threats. So uh, please, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I, I guess the easiest way to answer that question would be to, to you know, ask anybody. You go, go online, go, go find a tour operator, it'll take you to the Congo. Go open a Sunday paper and see, you know, in the travel section, if there's someone going to offer you a trip to the Congo. Because, you know, nowadays... In the 21st century, you can find pretty much anything. I can find a tour operator who'll take me up Mount Everest. I can find a tour operator who'll take me to run a marathon in the Sahara. I'll find someone who'll take me and I'll sail across the deepest oceans. Or indeed, I'll take a submarine to the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean. But the Congo ain't there. And that's why it's so intriguing for me. 150 odd years ago, a writer called Joseph Conrad had a very nice way of describing that part of Africa. He said in prosaic terms, the blankest of blank spaces on the Earth's figured surface. Which basically meant everywhere else had been mapped, but we didn't know anything about the Congo. Which is why Stanley is interesting for me. We'll come on to you know, why he's important later. But to come back to your question, what's the real estate like? It's a big lump of Africa, slap on the equator. QED, it's hot. Lots of forest, Tropical rainforest, thick, impenetrable. But to go from, go across the Congo, now let's just briefly have a little interlude so we understand what we're talking about. We're talking about a country which is named for a river. There's this massive river. The river bears the name today. It's had different names over the years, but it's known as the Congo. And it gives its name to two countries today, Republic of Congo and the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let's not go too, too hung up on this. One is a former French colony, one is a former Belgian colony. The bottom line is it's David and Goliath. One is small, one is ginormous. And the one I'm interested in is the ginormous one. From one side of this single country to the other is the same distance to go from London to Moscow. So it's a big, it's a country that could be a continent. But the challenge, the thing that makes it really intriguing is that it's not like any other continent. No, nothing works there. No roads work there. No airlines travel there. No ferries run on the river systems. Your cell phone may, may, you know, may, may not work. But cell phone in some areas, unheard of. So we're talking about an area fabulously challenging from a travel point of view. Forget the politics, forget the history. Just beguiling. It's a challenge. It's a kind of red flag for a bull. Are you up for this? 
And I just genuinely think crossing the Congo, even today, and I did this journey for Blood River 17 years ago. Actually, turns 18 this year. Even today, and I watch the country closely and changes, even today it remains the biggie, the great challenge. It's the Mount Everest of travel. You go to the Congo, you go over land through the Congo and survive. There are a number of risks. There is warfare in some areas. There's health hazards in another. You know, we're living through, you know, you hear the word Ebola. You've had an Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Where does that come from? The Congo. Uh, HIV AIDS. HIV comes from the Congo originally, original founding moment. Health could get you. War could get you. But much more intriguingly, and the reason you your word in the intro is, is so powerful, is just the ordeal. Because to travel there... You've really got to use your own wits. There are no roads for vast swathes of the country. There are no meaningful towns. What towns there are are run by warlords. There is no meaningful central government. So from one side, London to Moscow, the capital, which happens to be over on the London side, say, their guys, they don't go over to Moscow. So the guys on the border, well, they're just guys with sharp, and, you know, with sharp knives or Kalashnikovs. So there's no central cohesion. So to travel... It's not like anywhere else. It's brilliantly challenging on all those dimensions, politically, militarily, culturally, medically, but logistically. And that's what makes it, for me, the purest journey I could imagine. Because you are asking yourself, can you take yourself as far out of your comfort zone as it's possible to go and give it a crack? And I did, and I was hugely lucky in the way the journey turned out. Let's talk about that risk then. And I'm sure you'll be able to anecdotally throw out, comment more specifically on um, what, the, what, what makes it the ordeal in terms of your experience at the airport, uh, your experience handling bikes, your experience getting bikes, access to fuel, all this sort of stuff, which we would obviously take for granted in any other country. But to ask specifically about the risk, this was something I really, it, it sort of stopped me and I had to really think about because you were, um, you know, from most outward measures, a very successful uh, journalist, right? You know, a foreign correspondent to the continent for the Telegraph. Um, you also had a wife, so there's extra responsibility there. You know, you'd be letting someone else down if you hurt yourself, not just yourself. Um, and there was one moment as you were leaving the Uruguayan boatsman and giving, uh, and you were given a choice to continue alone or to turn back. And you knew if you turned back, the journey was over. And if you continued alone, there was absolutely no going back. And you're a white man, you got a couple hundred dollars under the soles of your shoes. You're venturing into territory where there is just no ability to find help. And um, you concluded by taking the risk. So um, how did you manage to do that? I guess um, the background, as you say, is that I was a journalist, uh, a war correspondent for a number of years in a number of different places. And I had got frustrated by the herd. Everyone, the journalists, all hanging together. The same satellite dishes, the same people, the same smells, the same issues. Oh, he's greedy, he takes the food. She's a pain in the arse, she steals the shower bag. You know, so, you know, the herd, everyone's together. And I wanted to, to, to prove myself alone. Because to be in the herd, I felt I was lost in a, in a, in a group. So I was drawn to this challenge, this challenge across in the Congo. Um, there's a historical connection with journalism we can have a little look, look to in the, in, 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 later on if we want. But in terms of risk, I've been shot at in Sarajevo. I've been shelled in Lebanon, I've been shelled in Iraq. I've crossed front lines into Gaza. I've, you know, you know done some, create, you know, had bullets wing past me in Kosovo. I've done the risk. Risk is not something that I am um, unaware of. But let me tell you, I'm very risk averse. I hate it. I'll hide it. I'll hide under the bed. And there's ways of managing risk. And you learn how to deal. If you're going to go to a potentially go to a hazarded place, really one of the dangerous, most dangerous places ever went was central London. We had a riot in April of 1990. There's a poll tax. Mrs. Thatcher, cast your mind back decades into the different century. Mrs. Thatcher, at the, when she was, uh, she was British leader, very unpopular, she tried to impose a tax. The, the centre of London was set, about, set on fire, effectively. Trafalgar Square, 30,000 people fighting with the police, riot gear, the whole lot. And I remember as a journalist running down a main street in London, the Strand, 
running towards the flames and 30,000 people were running against my flow. And I felt strange. I felt like that sort of Monty Python character when they, she shouts up, you're all individuals. And the voices say, we're all individuals, the crowd. And it's all a bit sort of confusing. Why am I running to... Anyway, the point is, that was pretty... <laughs> that had its moments. I can deal with risk, but I'm very, very cautious. I will manage it. And I describe in the book, actually, a little section where you have objective risk and subjective risk. What's the subjective risk? Subjective risk is, are you healthy enough? Are you fast enough? Do you know a language? Do you have the right gear? These are the things that you've got control over. They are subject to you. You've got to, you know, you don't cross a front line at one in the afternoon in daylight. The guys are sober and awake and they could shoot you. You do it at four o'clock in the morning. They're always pissed and asleep. You mitigate the risk. You reduce it. And in the Congo, there's a lot of warry areas. So you, you, you managed to, I, I knew I could handle that. Subjective risk. Objective risk is something that's out of your hands. It's the objective risk of walking across a glacier field on the, at the height of an alpine climb. There could be a crevasse beneath you. You will fall to your death if you go into that crevasse. But the only way to get up this hill is to go across that, that uh, glacier. So do you accept it? And, they come, and you don't walk across the glacier at three in the afternoon when the sun's been on it. You walk across it at half past early when, you know, blah, 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 blah. So you reduce and you manage. And... I apply the same principles, which is, you know, I will do everything I can subjectively to reduce it, but I will accept a level of objective risk. And I hope that doesn't sound blasé, but it's exactly the same objective risk that you, listener, subject yourself to when you drive a car, when you break the speed limit, which we all do. You, you know, it's that sort of thing. You're rolling the dice. And I rolled the dice in the Congo and I came up with these extraordinary help, uh, the, the assistance of some amazing people, these great guides, I rolled the dice and it was a series of episodes of rolling the dice. I don't want to sound too grand, but you know, a guy like me did a similar trip down the Niger River, which is in a different part of Africa, the, the, name that gives its, uh, the river that gives its name to Niger, of course, only a couple of years before I did my trip. His body was never found. He rolled the dice, he came up one and two. I rolled the dice and I was fortunate. So there is, you have to accept a degree of not being in control, mm. but you reduce that to as much as you possibly can. And then you acknowledge that you're putting yourself at risk, but is it worth it? And for me, proving myself away from the herd, challenging myself to do something was worth it. It was it with the return on investment, crude terms. <laughs> Um, was yes, it made it just it just changed my life because it gave me such a better understanding of a fundamentally important but often overlooked part of of our world, not just the physical part of the world, the Congo. I'm talking about how people behave under pressure, and we see it now. Whether it's January the sixth in the capital when you get a different form of American that you've never seen before, you know, challenging, you know, breaking, sitting in the speaker's chair in the House of Representatives, or you see it in. UK, where you've got you know personal conciliaries and advisors of the Prime Minister lying, lying about COVID rules. It's about what you accept as a person, as a person in the modern world, as part of your nation state, part of the, the community that you're in. And the Congo, it strips it back. I love it because it strips back all the camouflage and the bullshit and the artifice. It leaves you with very pure forms. What do you do to survive? And uh, the journey was constant process of making that decision. And you, you picked up a nice moment. There was a moment, dear listener, where I'm on the upper section of the Congo River trying to make progress. And there are no powered boats on a 700 kilometer stretch of a river in the 21st century. Not a single powered boat, not a single local powered boat. There's one UN boat, United Nations boat, run by some Uruguayans, and they go down to maybe 150 k's. And that's good. It's going to take me in that area. But then after that, I'm going to have to leap. I'm going to have to make my way. I'm going to have to leave them and make a plan. And... Um, these guys took me that day. I'll never forget because my the, by then I'd been traveling a while. My belly was just not used to food because I, you know, everything is, everything changes. And they, they had a plates of chips on their boat. It was in Crack and River. It's strange to remember these chips, fresh chips, because these are Uruguayans. They eat chips and steak all the time when they're not drinking mate, that <laughs> green drink. So these guys chew it. They're ch they're chowing on steak and chips in the Congo in their own bubble of Uruguayanness. 
desperate to get back to Uruguay. I don't want to be anywhere near the Congo. Desperate to get back to their next pint of mate. And we we pull over and it's 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 twilight and we come to a village. Um, and uh, the captain Jorge was his first name, but weirdly because of Britain's influence in Montevideo, his surname was Wilson. Jorge Wilson, Captain Wilson, <laughs> Spanish speaking. He says, um, "You really, you know, do you really want me to leave? You know, because." There's no helping you if you're you know, from here. And I, by then I go up into the village, I've spoken to some fishermen, would they prepare to take me? Yes, they would. So I had a plan, I had a move. You know, they could take me in a, in a, in a hollowed out tree trunk, a prerogue is their name, prerogue, uh, canoe. And I made a plan with them and I said to him, yeah, this is the moment. This is my crossing the front line at two in the morning moment. This is my going into Gaza with a 120 millimeter main battle tank armament um, tracking me across the open, the open ground near the Eros um, border checkpoint. This is the moment. This is Sarajevo sniper rally in 1994. Just you have to accept this risk. And um, he shook my hand, got his guys back in his little rubber dinghy, and it was a tender. He put us into the shore, and I tell you, the sound of that engine of that boat going back up river left me with a silence that was more deafening than any silence I have ever heard in my life. That sound of modernity, of normality, and internal combustion engine, which implied fuel and parts and skills and engineers, all of that, it was diminishing. And it kind of just fell away to nothing. And then I was, there, I was left with this deafening silence. And uh, it was a very pure moment. Strangely, it was twilight now. Obviously, we're on the equator, so when t you know uh, the evenings come very quickly, bam, the sun goes down, and it was um, these guys. I say, right, we get on our boat. We, let's go now. I don't want to hang around, become a sec uh, focus of attention. So we go on the boat, and within an hour, the moon rises, and uh, you could even look it up. It would be the full moon of August two thousand and four. I can't remember, can't remember which day that would be. Maybe late late August, early maybe the first two few days of September. It rose, and it was a, a hunter's moon. It was that pink, large moon. And as a traveller who's travelled in many places, many places, I have to most say, that moment on the river, dealing with the afterwash of adrenaline coming out of my system, dealing with the fear, dealing with the uncertainty, and now dealing with beauty unbridled. A pink full moon rising over the rainforest of Central Africa in total silence and just the drip, drip, drip of the water falling off the blades of these pirogistes as they moved me gently, moved us gently down the stream, upstream actually, um, or downstream. Uh, it was amazing. It was a sublime, sublime moment. And so, long answer, risk is real. Risk, don't ignore it. Risk, learn to manage it. It's certainly not crude. Uh, the audience is very familiar with the language of risk. Most of them actually came to this podcast from a piece of Nassim Taleb content that I have made. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the guy, but it's, it's uh, a discussion of risk, randomness, chance. Um, he really is kind of a big guru on this topic. So um, yeah, it's, it makes a lot of sense. It, it, more than I think you can appreciate, especially to me, uh, separating your tasks and things in front of you into objective and subjective risk. But l maybe you could say specifically what your objective risks were um, because they, in a war-faring country where there is large um, distances without any roads and... Uh, you know, people living lawlessly in the jungle. Uh, cannibalism was still around. Uh, you weren't exactly sure who you could or could not rely on. Can you explain uh, explicitly what the objective risks were? The Congo, the area that I was passing through, is a mosaic of tiny little tiles. And each tile is a fiefdom. And the fiefdom belongs not to the central government, because as I said, that doesn't function. It belongs to whoever carries the biggest weapon. And there might be a group there who are known as the Interahamwe, who were the former genocidaire from Rwanda, been hiding in that area for the last 30 years because they can't go to Rwanda because the Tutsis kicked them out. Or it might be the Mai Mai or sub-factions of the Mai Mai who were rebels. Or it might be disaffected Ugandan soldiers who left. Or Joseph Kony's crew, the Lord's Resistance Army. Or disaffected Burundians who are having a fight with the government. So every piece of land you're in has the potential 
to put you up against some people who uh, use violence to control. And as a white person, I, you know, clearly I'm going to stand up and be very visible. Mm. So one <laughs> risk, one risk is being taken hostage. One risk is getting killed straight up for violence. One risk is straightforward criminality. You mentioned a couple of thousand US dollars. I, I had them on the insoles of my boots. So, you know, under the insole, between the insole and the shoe itself. And uh, as I say, uh, there are plenty of cases of journalists or wanderers or travelers who, was, who were killed for their, their gear. Um, the other major risk was health. Um, you're in an area where, you know, clean water isn't a given, clean food isn't a given. Uh, tropical disease is very real. And you're in an area where logistics make mean you get, you know, you can risk a lot crossing a river. How do you cross a river when the bridges are down? Well, you know, take a ferry. Mm, there aren't any ferries. Um, take a boat on the river. Oh, okay. I mentioned that there were no powered boats in that upper section of the river. That's That was factually absolutely true in 2004 when I did this trip. Nowadays, there are a few. Um, and on the lower section, when I did it, there were some. But I can't tell you how risky they are because they sink. And you just Google Congo River disaster. Just Google it now. And there will be, within the last month, several incidents where 10 lost their lives, 150 lost their lives, unknown numbers lost their lives. So the um, logistical risks, you know, boats sinking, engines catching fire, that sort of thing. Um, but my major risk, the thing that, sticks above in, in, the thing I was more worried about was just lawlessness you're coming across people who are in a broken society which is what makes it so pure because it holds a mirror up to all of us that this is what happens to you if your society if it goes all Lord of the Flies right it goes this is when you break away if you strip away everything this is what happens lawlessness the potential for for the negative human behaviors, human characteristics mm. to come out. And I was more scared of that, of, of just being the victim of someone who said, oh, he's got shoes with laces, sure. boots with laces. That's worth yeah. cutting his throat for. And I'm just trying to, and I'm trying, you know, it's, it's hard to convey. But, I, but about the same time I was there, about a year later, two European guys, they happened to be Norwegian, were traveling, not on a boat and not in the remote areas, but an area where there was a road, they could take a taxi. Well, they just, something happened. Something went wrong. And the, there was a crash or a vehicle. The driver is dead. Those two guys ran into the bush. They were caught. And one died of malaria four years later. Uh, the other just about survived after years and years of being held effectively hostage by the government of the Congo, who went to the Norwegians and said, these people are spies. You need to give us millions of pounds for the damage that they've wrought. And of course, they did no damage at all. So it's that sort of thing, but wonderful. So those, are, those, are, I'm so, without sort of labouring the negative, what are the positives in terms of risk management? The really helpful thing about the Congo is that it is very, very big, <laughs> and you can hide in a big space. And I learned this really weird reversal of my perceived normality. And I say my perceived because really I'm just it was just an illusion. My perceived normality is. Towns are the places you go for safety, right? Villages, rural areas, that's where it's a bit wild. There be dragons, you know, outside the town walls. Those are, that's the kind of medieval view. And today, towns, police are, order, traffic lights, people queuing up at the post office, all that sort of thing. Reverse in the Congo. Towns, bad. Villages, rural, bush, good. Because the guys in the towns, they are corroded. That authority has been twisted and decomposed. The negative has bubbled to the surface. There's no court system. It doesn't belong. The right of law? Oh, never one's heard of that. It evaporated 50 years ago. So in towns, you could there could be the head honcho who is the local cut who wants, hey, who is this European who's turned up? Go, bring him to bring him now. Where's his paper? Where's his pass? His, uh, you know, uh, you know, order de mission, your purpose of reason, your reason for traveling. Could you imagine him to come up with a piece of paper that gives the reason to travel nowadays? Mm. You know, this isn't the 19th century anymore, but that's the demand. Well, ordre de mission. What is your actual function here? Unless there's a, a, an official stamp piece of paper, you're a spy. You're clearly a spy and I'm going to put pressure on you. And uh, that happened a couple of times, that threat. 
But interestingly, as I chatted to people through this journey, I had this constant refrain. Whenever people told me their story, at some point there was always this, nous avons foué à la bouche, we fled into the bush. And just pause and think what that means. We fled into the bush. They ran away from the trappings of civilization, the towns, cities, groups, communities, and they went feral because that was better. And so my big plus is that I could hide myself in this vast, wide, huge canvas. And there was a lovely moment, I remember, when I was quite early on in the trip. I was on a motorbike, as you mentioned, worming down a tiny little footpath where a road had once been, but that road had been eaten by the bush with a really brave pair of motor bicyclists who were prepared to take me. They themselves had never been in this area. They were just pushing a route through for an NGO. And they, 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 I was happy to have a sort of coincidence of our interests. We're going to go into the same area. And I knew that there were some, some rebels, and I knew that there were some soldiers in this area. And I bumped into rebels at one point, and they kind of let us go because it was you know, that half past early in the morning trick, so you move quickly. But then later in the day, we went past a military checkpoint, and <laughs> I'll never forget, because we were going at 25, 30 k's an hour down a trail, this soldier at a checkpoint was literally asleep because he hadn't heard an, industrial, an internal combustion engine for six months. He was not exactly ready for an internal combustion engine. And the sound of this motorbike didn't stir him till we were past him. So we were gone. And I looked over my shoulder and he got up with his gun and he's flapping and shaking. But if you move quickly, you know, you can, people can be a bit flat footed. And uh, mm. this soldier, who would have been a massive pain, guns, pieces of paper, accusations mm. of being a spy, the routine, the routine of traveling in Congo is if you meet anyone from the authorities, they won't know who you are. Unless they've got a piece of permission that they recognize from their authorities, they will demand, they will impose one on you. There'll be money, there'll be threats, there'll be coercion, and there'll be weapons. You, the word you hear all the time, espion, espion. Vous êtes un espion. You're a spy. And uh, once they unleash the espion word, you know you've slid down the snake and you're going back to the start. Anyway, so this soldier, there he was, and I looked at my shoulder as I was riding pillion on this tiny little 125 bike. Can you imagine, you know, listeners... A uh, picture, a uh, uh, bike, 125 cc. That's you know, that's a Deliveroo bike for delivering scooter, pizza yeah. around the corner. That's a scooter, but they, that was a fabulous bike to use, because anything bigger just couldn't deal with this horrific terrain of ruts and gullies and potholes. And this is not tarmac. Tarmac's gone, finish, gone, chalas. That was eaten years ago. It's mud and branches and roots and tree trunks and rocks and just the general sort of jungly stuff. So you need a bike that you can physically pick up and uh, drag over an obstacle. Um, anyway, so there I was on this pin and I looked over and there was this soldier and he was sort of jumped to attention. But we were gone. And so that was one method. And traveling in these areas, I've always learned, you know, you, you travel light. You, do, you learn to dance. I had no, you know, no film crew, no accompaniment, no partner, just me, my rucksack and my $2,000 in my boots. And if you'd been any more, you would have, you would have drawn too much attention. You know, you would have had to have gone I agree. with an armed brigade everywhere you went. It would have been totally I, different. I've, 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 I mean, I'm still so into the Congo. I, I watch. And occasionally on the internet, you'll, a flicker will come up. Someone will have traveled. Journeys are done in the Congo. It's rare. But it's interesting. People tend to write about them or advertise them or do a film or what have you. Mm. And there was six South African motorbikes bicyclists uh, about four years ago. Um, had a crack. And they had a wealthy guy who was one of them, and he had this thing about biking through Africa. But it was quite interesting because you could tell how his little film had been put together. That he each town had, you know, basically there were these six white guys on big Swedish motorbikes. Husk, uh, are they Husqvarna? They're called Husqvarna. Husqvarna. Yeah, yeah, it's not a Hus Swedish brand. Yeah, it's a Swedish brand. And they were on these I didn't big. Know they, did bikes. Ma they did match macho bikes, um, but occasionally. Occasionally, in the corner of the shot, you saw their guide on a one-two-five, and he was zipping ahead, getting to the local <laughs> town, and making sure yeah. that the governor was squared away, and la 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 la. And mm. that's how you have to work if you're going to go in a group. Mm. Um, no, I, I traveled light. I did. Those guys could afford it. They, they would have burnt lots of cash, making mm. sure. How does one say? Paradoxically, Oiling it would wheels. have been a very expensive place to go. Oh, wow, you can't believe it's so cold. Mm. You know, the, the numbers are terrifying. But it, it, I had a couple of advantages. If you're on a rush, that immediately makes you, uh, puts you in a weak position. 
because people can exploit that. Oh, you're in a hurry, are you? You just sit there and you just mm. boil for half a day and you'll get your passport back, you know, if you give us some money. If you're not in a rush, you say, okay, half a day, half a week. I don't mind. I'm here. But people do get bored. So you've got to learn to be, have a lot of patience. You've got to learn how to count cockroaches going up the wall of a cell. That's quite a useful skill to have because you just race them in your mind past the time. And if you're cool, then that takes away the leverage from many uh, coercers who try mm. to be a pain in the ass. But uh, let's not dwell on the negative too much. Let me just mention that um, everyone's seen Africa from the sky, from the satellite image. There's a great lake in the middle of it, Lake Tanganyika. It's long and thin. It's like a little tear. My journey starts halfway up the left-hand side of that, the western bank of Lake Tanganyika. And I go for 700 k's through the bush to the upper Congo River. And in, in essence, the journey has two parts, a land part and a river part. And the land part is getting across this terrain. And it is fabulous. It is the richest, most fertile, most verdant, most interesting, most aesthetically beautiful, most rewarding terrain possible. It has Truly. rivers to wow. die for. Extraordinary rich rainforest, extraordinary trees with great buttresses on the side that look as frankly the creators of those gothic cathedrals didn't even come close in terms of beauty to the flying buttress of the sinew of a cotton tree that stands 80 meters in the sky and it needs these buttresses to support it amazing extraordinary mm. insect life um, bird life uh, butterflies flowers ex giant palm trees i remember going through this giant palm tree plantation which had echoes of something that had been there before, an old palm industrial plantation long since gone. And these palm trees had gone to seed and their fronds were hanging down like some sort of rag doll's limbs. Absolutely extraordinary. On a scale you can't, the beggar's belief. Mm. It was very, very attractive. And just so much hope there. So much, I mean, the soil is so fertile. You talk to the villagers, they don't have to put fertilizer in, they don't have to put inputs, phosphates, all of these things that the industrial Western farmer has to think of because Mother Nature does it for it. Every year the floods come, you know, and whew, another bunch of fertilizer comes, the soil comes down. So extraordinarily positive things, but measured against the negative of, of modern human extreme behavior. And I say extreme mm. because the, the guys I'm talking about, they are the minority, the thugs, the brutes, the coercers, the bullies, the gangsters, the warlords, the soldiers, they are the minority. Most of the people in the Congo just want to crack on, and they're fabulous. So the guys who help me on the motorbikes, the villagers who have passed through, time after time after time. We came to one village where it was too dangerous for us to light a fire. The, the, the village chief said, we can't light a full fire to welcome you as we would normally, because if we have a fire, the people will know the word will spread that we've got visitors. So we'll just sit here quietly. And we arrived after dark and, and you know, you have to hide. This is a weird consideration. But then five miles back, we'd seen the villages burnt out with the little circular rings of ash where the houses had been burnt to the ground. And they just were a circular. Wow. You know, whoosh, and they'd been burnt by the rebels, you know, a short while before. And five miles before that, or 10 miles before that, whatever, a kid, when I'd stopped, we had a flat tire. And this kid said, do you want to see the bones? And I said, what do you mean the bones? You know, and you said in your intro a few questions ago, you mentioned cannibalism and, and the violence. And these, it sounds awful to, it sounds a bit of a cliche to kind of keep referring to those old stereotypes from Africa. The Africa of the kind of patronizing 19th century, oh, it's a dark place and we're, civilization is lifting the veil of, 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 of uh, barbarity and it's only us jolly, jolly white chaps from public schools in England who are going to sort it all out. And that's all bullshit. But I'm telling you, in the 21st century, this kid says to me, do you want to see the bones on the floor? And I, and I kind of went, yeah, sure. Would, would, I didn't know what he meant. We walked and there were these human bones, skulls, ribs, femurs. And I, know, I recognize a similar pattern in a war area in Kosovo, for example, where I've seen war graves or I've seen war dead. Um, I've seen you know, atrocities. I said, but in Kosovo, someone, you know, you, rank, you ask the guy, when did this happen? They say, oh, that was in July when these rebels fell, fought with the KLA or the, the, the Kosovo Liberation Army fell in with it. Well, so, so they've got a narrative. I asked this guy in the Congo, where are these bodies? 
And this was the really spooky thing. I don't know, he said. Can't be sure. Could be the Ugandans, who were here last year. Might have been the Rwandans, who were there the year before. Then there was the inter and then there was the Mai Mai. When did it happen? Well, I don't know, maybe a year ago, maybe three years ago. Can't tell, really. The bones are bleached by the sun. And that was an amazing lesson. Because you could imagine going to a society or a place with no institutional memory. Sure, we all grumble about journalists. We all grumble about social media, about transparency, about all that. Yeah, we all grumble. That's quite, quite rightly so. But if you didn't have it, that if a political leader could destroy a community and walk away, what sort of society are you living in? And that was what was extraordinary. That in the Congo, it is so common for bodies to litter the ground that no one buries them. There's no one left to bury them. And that was just one little snapshot. So it, that was this amazing contradiction. A beautiful place, a piece of real estate as attractive as any. The Belgians, when they went there, they used to write rhapsodies about it in the 1930s and 20s, about how high it was. It was no, no mosquitoes, no malaria, beautiful, rich soil, blah, 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 blah. And yet, juxtapose that with this extraordinary reality. And that's what made the mm. journey so, so powerful and so unforgettable. I had no idea it was um, just as beautiful as you're saying. Clearly, it's beautiful. It's in Africa and it's, you know, untouched country. But my impression of rainforests is it's tough to appreciate the beauty because you're constantly under a canopy. Um, but truly, so I imagine you've traveled to most of them, you know, Namibia, Botswana, Latin America, beautiful places in the world. Congo exists as the most beautiful place you've been. Oh, I wouldn't say most beautiful and make as if that's a single meaningful superlative. Right. I, what I because you know how could one compare you know the rainforests of the Irrawaddy Valley in Burma with you know Pakistan or or Congo or or the Andean Mountains or whatever. In um, I would say this that it is rewarding aesthetically. It is a tantalizingly beautiful place, and mm. and that doesn't sit with that kind of cliched view when you. You know, most people who you know, understand the, where the, the, what the Congo is as a place, as a space, they can be forgiven for you know, holding on to the old cliched images, which is you know, Heart of Darkness. That was a novel published 130 years ago by a person, a traveler, who traveled on the river in the Congo. His name was Joseph Conrad, which is his pen name. He was, in fact, Polish, with a very long and unpronounceable Polish name. <laughs> uh, and he went there as a genuine skipper, a sailor, a mariner, a guy with a mariner's ticket, very competent man. And what he saw in terms of human behavior, this was not behavior of the locals, this was behavior of the outsiders, the colonial agents, the colonial pioneers. What he saw was so vile and so bestial and so brutal that it fermented in his heart for almost 10 years. He was there in 1890 and he publishes in 1899. It's not a very long novel. It's 33,000 words long. It's a novella. It's very short. Um, but he frames it as the heart of darkness. And some people have said, oh, he's telling us that Africa is the heart of darkness. No, he's not. No, he's not. Mm. He's telling us that every human heart has a propensity to darkness. Doesn't matter what color the package is, what skin mm. color, eye shape, texture of hair, that's all bullshit. It's all irrelevant. Every human heart has the potential for darkness. And that's what's powerful. Anyway, point is heart of darkness, that's the cliche, that's the image. Apocalypse now, Francis Ford Cop Coppola, Martin Sheen going up the river, all of that. Um, and yet, I didn't find darkness, I found bright. I mean, incandescent light in the middle of the day, Different learning different versions of green. You can look at a bush in the rainforest, as you say, if you're away from the canopy, if you're under the canopy, it's impenetrable. Um, and you learn what green is, because where the sun is in the sky dictates the type of green. It's amazing. Dawn, it looks like this. 10 in the morning, it looks like that. 12, it looks almost gunmetal gray. It's washed out. It's vertical. And then as the sun loses the angle of approach of the light, anyway, you just get to learn different different greens uh, mm. I, I love that as i you know as i as that's I a beautiful on these way days. to say it you learn greens. different greens and um anyway, it, it ain't a dark place what it is is a place where humanity has, has, has attempted to come up with something and largely um 
failed to come up with a place that's comfortable and easy. It is tough. It's subsistence living. The colonial project there was vile. And can I just briefly at this point say what I'm doing this for? Why I went to the Congo, why I was attracted, why I was drawn there were two reasons. First of all, just about every modern African story has its root in the Congo. You know, every issue, whether it's the Rwandan genocide, directly connected with the Congo. Uh, Angolan war genocide, directly, Mr. Mugabe clinging on to power, directly connected to the Congo. It's just like the mother Darfur, directly connected with the Congo. Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, and, and, and. All of these stories, they have this kind of influence with this one place. But because it's so chaotic, it's hard to, to grasp it. And then you run the tape back a bit. You go, run the, hold on, when does this, what's the history of this place? The modern history of the Congo begins with outsiders, white explorers. Locals had lived there for centuries, for millennia. They'd tamed the landscape. They knew how to move along the rivers. But the modern history begins with, in the era of Victorian explorers. And it begins with a guy, as you said in your intro, H.M. Stanley, Henry Morton Stanley. And he changes everything by forcing a route through the rainforest that I've just described, crossing on a motorbike to the river and then down the river. And this is so important. It's the turnkey moment in white exploration in the Victorian era. It's the turnkey because all those others, Burton, Speak, Livingston, De Brazza, ones, names you've heard of elsewhere, Mungo Park, they did great things, but they didn't really impact history. They didn't change stuff. Stanley does because the moment he emerges and he charts the river, a colonial power says, oh, I'll use that river for a colony. We'll start grabbing land in Africa. And that's why it's important. And this guy, who was he? Was he a scientist? No. Was he a geographer? No. Was he a government agent? No. Was he a diplomat? No. He was the worst of all things, Ryan. He was a grubby <laughs> journalist. He was a journalist for a British newspaper. And the perverse and weird and slightly curious and tantalizing thing, the same newspaper that employed me. So he was sent by the Daily Telegraph in the 1870s. And I see that moment as the founding, the original sin the original sin of white colonial rule is a journalist fiddling his expenses, bullshitting his stories, spinning up what he achieved, lying, being vainglorious, just like, say, another Telegraph journalist, uh, Boris Johnson today. The same, exactly the same logic, self-aggrandizement, self-importance. He does something and he changes the course of history in Africa. I come all these years later, I want to go back to the founding moment. And so in a strange way, I'm kind of following my journalistic forebear, if that's not mm. too pompous. I'm glad you uh, brought in H.M. Stanley because it's going to inform my next question. This, this question for me really is what the whole book is about, and um, you've just reintroduced H.M.S. Stanley. Um, you have all these synchronicities with him. Uh, same, same trip, same dirty journalist from the same dirty rag, and uh, the point was to almost juxtapose your experience from his, or maybe not the point, but at least a big revelation that came out of the trip was juxtaposing the difficulty of the trip the, and so forth. And there's this anecdote that you tell with um, an old man in Manitou, I think was the tribe, though I might be getting it wrong. Um, and it was this just such amazing insight that this guy gave or that you noticed in this man which was that he had experienced as a 70, 80 year old man, more, more, more modernity than his grandchildren did. And you make the point that progress in the Congo is inverted because this man back in the fifties, when things were thriving, he experienced functional trains, cars, riches, foreign food, European beers, um, all the stereotypes of a rich colonial town. Um, whereas his, this same man's grandkids in 2004 lived in the shells of these former buildings. They never got a break from their cassava diet. Uh, they had never seen a car, let alone driven in one. And then, as you say, it's inverted. And this is a quote from the book. While the rest of the world is steadily making improvements, somehow the Congo, despite its riches, is declining. The forest, not the town, offers the sanctuary. I cannot think of anywhere else in the world where this is true. At a place with an amazing history, but no present. Anyway, yeah. it, it is. It's it's my the, the most powerful single motif I take with me 
from the trip, which is that this presumption on the outside world, and sure, we get wobbly periods of recession when you get to, as we all know, the definition of a recession is two uh, parts of the quarters year. Of negative growth. Quarter, eh, eh, negative growth. We can do. We can run the. We can run the uh, the economics uh, uh, one hundred and one definition of it. We get that, but what you don't get is catastrophic regression and decline, and that's why the Congo is so important for me. Yes, anecdotally, it's very strong. There were images that moment in the village around the fire, and he himself knew more about the internal combustion engine, age 70, than his grandchildren. We turned up on a motorbike, the kids, it was the dragon. They had no idea. What the hell is this, what is this thing? We've heard Grandpa talk about it. Maybe the dragons are true. Maybe those stories he told us are true. Where, are, where you know, everywhere else in the world, it's the grandkids who are replugging your phone, right? They're mm -hmm. kind of reprogramming the apps on your on your on your computer because they're all so kind of savvy. The reverse is true. But the really, the most powerful thing is, it challenges your naive self delusion that growth and advancement and thriving are all inexorable. You know, we're all baby boomers or kids of baby boomers brought up post-1945. It's been a hell of a run. The world has just been steady, real terms growth since 1945. Thank you very much. Surges at periods, quieter periods at others, oil crisis certainly. But wow, what an economic run and extraordinarily peaceful since 1945, thanks to NATO and the European Union. And we, I think there's a danger that we think that's normal. We think that's inevitable. We think that is inexorable. In fact, we might even use that terrible word that's so common. It's our right. It's our right. We have rights. Rights and inexorability and inevitability mean the square root of fuck all in the Congo. Nothing. Because it's pared back. There is no right there at all. All of the things that you take for granted... There's a policeman who'll come and sort you out. There's a fireman who'll put a fire out in your house. There's a postman who's going to deliver a letter for you. There's a road that the postman can drive down. That There are lights on the road that the postman... It's all gone. And that is why the Congo, I think, is so important. Because it reminds us to challenge that thinking. And yes, I'm serious. January 2006... Sorry, 6th of January 2021 in the capital in Washington. That was a moment, a wobbly moment that reminded me, ooh, ooh, that's a little bit Congolese, isn't it? Isn't that a little moment? And then when I see Boris Johnson's government of the UK trying to change the rules to protect one corrupt MP, he will change the entire disciplinary process to protect one crony. And I just think, ooh, isn't that a little bit Congolese? And when I hear about national groups being persecuted for no reason, or Belarusians taking Syrians and dumping them on the border in, in Poland as a deliberate political act to destabilize Poland, QED, the European Union. I just think, ooh, haven't we been there before with ethnic Rwandans, the Banyamalengi in Eastern Congo? It's a bit complicated and it's a bit opaque, but if you dare to pull back that rainforest canopy, I wonder if in the Congo we're not looking at something very, very important, potentially the ghost of Christmas to come. And that's why I think it's so important. And that's why I think it was worth doing. Um, you have to be wide eyed about it. And you, people could challenge me and say, oh, you're not comparing apples with apples. You're completely fabricating it. But I wonder, I do wonder, because I think humans are the same. And that sense of everything will grow forever I wonder if after banking crises of 2008, after COVID, after now we're looking at stagflation, you're looking at um, growth, but wages going backwards, um, real-term wages declining. Ooh, aren't these the wobbles that lead to the power grab of the few, which is the Congolese history, a power grab, a dictatorship, a rule. The reason the country is so broken, the one I described, it's not because it's inevitable, it's because the government at the centre stole everything. Just said, it's more important to line our pockets than it is to maintain those post offices and those roads and those power lines. And therefore, this is why I think it's very important. Um, and as I said in the book several times, 
a country where the hands of the clock go backwards, not forwards. Mm. And I just wonder if that might not apply to other parts of the world very soon or sooner than we might be comfortable with. It made me think, uh, obviously you're speaking about this notion of there being a thin veneer of society or society is the thin veneer, one, one of those. And, uh, the bubbles quote in the wire, there's a thin line between heaven and here. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought about when you were in... Bubbles in the, the wire, oh my God, we're jumping, excellent, the wire, let's talk about the wire for six hours. We love the wire, <laughs> Baltimore, West Baltimore, East Baltimore. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, but, uh, like, Omar, he, Omar's in the hood. As he's stepping out of the car from, you know, the nice day with the cops and he walks into his, like, homeless place to sleep for the night. His drug, you his had drug a, pit. Yeah, you had a, an experience like that. Um, I forget the name of the, the big functioning city in the Congo, but you were sort of, um, at the end of your trip, you'd rolled into town and you were swept up by the local diplomats and whatever and they made a big deal about your trip and you sat down to european beers beautiful food beautiful garden and it's like you know there's a thin line between oh, yeah. beers and the, that's the yeah, same right. country um, <laughs> no you're right that was a there was a, i had a swing without without wanting to disturb your listeners too much i went i had a shower and um i had there was a button in the shower that i'd never seen and it was an all over body massage button can you believe I had to go to Kinshasa, the what? capital city of the Congo, to have my first and only ever shower with an all over. So I was in a house owned by a squillionaire guy who made money from mining, inevitably. Mm. And a little mm. bit of mining, a little bit of diamonds, a little bit of arm smuggling. And the money that he had meant that he could bring in the finest wines and the finest food and the finest trappings. So he had like basically a, like a Milan really cool apartment on the river in a house built on the river. Beautiful. Um, and so I pressed this button and this water, where the hell does that water come from? Ooh, I wasn't expecting that. And it kind of goes up and down. And um, it was an extraordinary moment. I mean, there was uh, Mr. Mr. Magoo, the simpleton. Oh, I didn't know they, they'd invented these things. <laughs> but your image of a thin veneer, let me tell you, that was a, uh, an estate of houses on the river, the, the banks of the river, landscaped, cleared, attractive. And outside there was this, perimeter get a wall of high breeze blocks with broken glass set in cement at the top and a cast iron rusted ah, gate that was got armed by man by armed guards and you used to have to drive up to that gate and they would swing it open and you went out into the chaos of Kinshasa and then went back and then the, the cast iron door would uh, swing back and then you'd be in the noise and the, anyway, so that's your thin veneer the thin veneer there was a rusted cast iron gate I can picture it now and from one side it was 21st century luxury and the other side was medieval madness um, it was a, a very very striking juxtaposition mm. um, could you speak about how without you know laboring on the history of the Congo and the role that the Belgians did in there because there's so much there's so many places people can learn about that but you making commentary on how people would travel back when there was this infrastructure in the country versus how you had it now, um, you know, comparing the two modes of life, you know, I think is the most tangible way to understand just how backwards the country sure. had, had gone. Okay, so as I said at the beginning of this chat, you don't go and look for a ticket to the Congo now. There isn't a, su sun, uh, a part of your Sunday supplement where you can turn and say, ah, Congo, it's there. There's Morocco, there's Blus, there's Chile, there's Andes, there's... but there ain't no Congo. The really weird thing is that I found a book from the 1950s, which was a travel guide, effectively, let's call it the Lonely Planet of the 1950s <laughs> for the Congo. Wow. And it was enormous. Mm. It was huge because it's a big piece of real estate. And I couldn't believe the detail in this book. It was absolutely fabulous. It was a guide for people to travel through the place where I was traveling through. And it told them, it is possible to drive from one side of the country to the other in 16 hours. You can average a speed of 84 kilometers an hour. I said, excuse me, how on earth would you be able to get 84 kilometers an hour? We grade the roads. We have a system of cantonniers. A cantonnier is a local uh, person employed to maintain a road for a five kilometer stretch. And he's paid a sum of five francs per month, whatever. And if you think about it for a second, what a brilliant idea. Cantonier, mm. everywhere there's a local pair of eyes looking at a road. So leaves are swept. If a crack starts, you fill it in quickly before it gets, before the river, you know, rainwater opens it into a chasm. Or if there's a blockage in a culvert, you can clear it. All that. So we have a system and we employ 34,000 Cantonier and we have 109,000 kilometers of road. They had 109,000 kilometers of paved road. 
It was a wonderful statistic from that book. But more importantly, it would literally say, if you want to go the route from Kinshasa to Bukavu, you must set out, and 162 kilometers after you've been in a easterly direction, you will see on your left. And it literally said that, and I couldn't mm. believe it. There were gîte, that old French concept of a guest house, gîte, G-I-T-E-S. There were gîte every 400 clicks. So you could always have somewhere to rest your head, just a basic house with a room, mozzie net, clean bed, bed linen, place to wash and someone to uh, prepare a meal. Couldn't pre-book, but you just pitched up. Travelers, travelers hostels. And my God, it said there with the gîte. And I remember at one point on my trip coming to a building and working out what I was looking at. And I was looking, as you said earlier, so eloquently at a shell of a building but it was actually an old jeet and i remember seeing a, a written in the cement scoured in the cement there was a bridge nearby and the, the bridge had fallen down but the cement with underneath the, the the building element of the bridge that kind of cement was still and someone in written in their fingers sort of uh emile 1956 so in 1956 an engineer called emile had put in that bridge and left with this little finger mark or his trial mark a little scar mark and of course gone to hell in a handbasket so um for me, that was as much, you know, forget the politics. You know, it was a functioning place. You could drive a Volkswagen Beetle across. You could get food. You could take a holiday. You could take photographs of this waterfall. You could go to this church. You could go to this festival. You could attend this seasonal food was available at this time of year. It said here, you your hunting license for this, blah, 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 blah. And I just thought, how wonderful. I was like looking at a book that belonged to sci-fi. And this was the book I was reading compared to the reality is exactly of the Congo is pretty much the same gap between, a, you know, reading, a, you know, Isaac Asimov in your bedroom and then looking out the window in Sweden. You know, that's the difference. Only one is going forward in time. One is going back in time. The, the gap was that yawning. And uh, it's just that functionality. And just briefly, my own mother, um, as a British person, travels to Africa in the 90, late 1950s, comes to South Africa, and to cut a long story short, she passes through the Congo as easy as anything at about 1958, 59. She just buys a ticket, you know, ticket. This train connects from northern Rhodesia, what is now Zimbabwe, into the Congo, and then you take a train to this place, and you get off, and then you join another train, and then in the middle of the night you get off the train, you walk down a riverbank, you get into a ferry, and the ferry takes you up here, and then that connects with another, and then that connects to a, to a ferry across a lake. Sounds a bit complicated, but it's all written down. You know, this train leaves at ten eleven. This the, the ferry arrives at two minutes past three. You know, it all worked, and it was that sense of once working, juxtaposed with what I was seeing, which was relics of buildings, rusting hulks of ships on the upper river. It looked like beached whales, like the rib cages of a decomposing whale. You're looking at a, a huge metal superstructure, like a Mississippi powerboat. Mississippi paddle boat, you know, in your imagination, Mark Twain, there they were, but just abandoned. And mm. that's what made it so um, visually, in terms of human influence, so visually striking, the sense of decay. And you opened up the chat saying uh, how even today, barely anything's changed. So in the last 20 years, it's either remained a constant or even maybe more of a decline. Uh, so well, what are we seventy the, years out now? And yeah, the um, the truth is, uh, as I say rather glibly, uh, since I did this journey, a lot has happened in the Congo, but not much has changed. There have been two election cycles, which makes it interesting. It was never democratic before I was there. It always had a dictator in power. Since then, uh, which was funny for a country called the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because it had dictators <laughs> who handed the, who handed power to their yeah. sons, so it wasn't very. But you've got to be skeptical of countries that have like. Uh, People's Republic D or exactly. Democratic DDR. in the title. Um, so uh, it's had two election cycles, which is great. But what does that do? It simply gives a rubber stamp of international acceptability and approval to a dictator. Let me be honest and let me be frank and let me not um, have any illusions about this. We have a dictatorship that's maintained power because you run the media, you can send your agents to smash up opposition groups. You can diffuse all opposition by relying on lots of independent parties. Blah, 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 blah. Bottom line is, it's had a couple of election cycles. It's had a lot of Chinese interest in the last 15, 20 years, which it didn't have before. Chinese promised to build a lot of the roads I said weren't there. Mm. Uh, Chinese, 
Chinese promised to build bridges, I said, were not there. They promised. Let me tell you how much they delivered. The, um, the, the sad truth is, you know, there are some areas where there might be some mi a mining asset. The Chinese are heavily there. But did they build the school 30 k's away or the bridge 50 k's away or the promised mm -hmm. infrastructure harbour 120 k's away? Uh, no, 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 no. They just built the perimeter of the mine, got the stuff out of the ground. They don't even process it there. They just ship it, get it on a the boat. They actually drive it all the way to South Africa, can you believe, to Durban, which is a big port. And all they're interested in is how the hell do we get this stuff to Shanghai? Yeah. And um, that is a slight difference. Uh, the war, the war that was active when I was there, has eased off. And yet other wars have flared up. So sadly, we have instability on the Ugandan border, which is now has an Islamic flavor, an Islamist flavor. You have that very nasty influence pervading through Africa now, the sort of jihadist, as they get, mm. as America silenced them in the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria, they've popped up like a, you know, whack a ball, bang, hit them there, the bam, they're up in the Maghreb or in Al-Qaeda in uh, West Africa, in uh, Sahel, in the Sahel, in Niger, and um, Mali and uh, Burkina Faso. They've also appeared in the Congo, sadly. Um, the town where I started my journey, the beautiful little port town on the western side of Lake Tanganyika, a tiny little pretty place called Kalemi, very pretty in its own day, that has 700,000 people sleeping in the in the bush behind it now. They were destabilized by some fighting and they wow. haven't been able to get 700,000. That's insane. You know, let me just give you the figures. You know, yeah. when London was bombed during the Blitz, they didn't 700,000 people didn't lose their homes. You know, but in the Eastern Congo, that was just another of the many rebellions and 700 people left their homes. They've walked, those that survived made it to Kalemi and they're sleeping under the, under the, under the trees uh, in abject misery as a result. So there's a huge UN thing there. Um, lots has happened, not much has changed. And the bottom line is, you know, I'm always intrigued. I, occasionally people who pa pass through the Congo, because I wrote a book, that, you know, had a degree of publicity, they, they get in touch. And I'm always fascinated. I've kept in touch with my guides and asked them about their changes of life, you know, what's happened. Benoit, who was the guy at the beginning of the journey, he's still around. I get better connectivity with him now because he's got a cell phone tower in his town instead of him having to go to a UN base. Um, uh, Ogi Saidi, the guy up in Kisangani, is a river guy. I've been able to get a message to him. So I get a feel... But my sense is it's still the same mm. extraordinarily mm. challenging uh, environment of having to survive rather than to, th to rather than to thrive. So to um, try and answer some questions for why that might be, uh, we move away from the narrative of Blood River, but still family in the Congo. Um, I just have some questions on the economic development of the country and also just, I suppose, the economy itself. Um, you are, you know, the book's riddled with uh, just case after case of classic sort of corruption. Everyone's hands need to be greased along the way. Um, are you sort of well researched on the typical, the um, kleptocrats of the country and the crony capitalism on the country are you you know is this something that you have paid and still pay a lot of attention to yes in as much as it's possible to um joseph kabila is the name of the dictator he took over from his father was assassinated he's had been legitimized by two elections he has nominally stood down but you read any of the uh, decent objective research organizations and they'll tell you how he has not really stood down he's just replaced himself with a puppet and he maintains a little bit like putin and the prime minister the premiership position of Russia, of course, that he had a, you know, he had a, when he was moved from president to, prep to prime minister and back again. Um, uh, occasionally, you get extraordinarily brave whistleblowers, and they will flag up uh, individual instances. Uh, there was a very controversial Orthodox Jewish Israeli investor called Dan Hertler, who was just emerging when I was traveling there. Since then, he snaffled up absolutely all of the assets in cobalt. Cobalt being wow. a substance that that you so are not figure. care about too much. Oh, he's fabulously dirty. What's and his What's his name? One more time. Dan Hertler. 
G E R T L E R Dan, and as I say, it's very interesting. Man. Orth- Orthodox Jewish Israeli. Very interesting. Uh, the yeah. last, the last man that Donald Trump tried to offer an amnesty for against criminal charges for illegal financial activity in America before Mr. Trump stood down was Dan Hurtler. He's very well connected, <sighs> and um, he had charges against him in America for uh, financial irregularities, all because of dodgy contracts in the Congo. But the terrible truth is, you could take that name, Dan Hurtler, and replace it with others Mm. in the the years and indeed the decades before. And he already has been replaced by others who have taken over. So it's the same constant stream of outsiders who exploit the institutional, I use that word, see, you and I, we live in a society where there's institutions, there are courts, there's a local councils there's electricity and the light behind me there's glass glaziers who put windows in here there are building standards officers to make sure these walls don't fall down there's an internet there's a fiber optic company who gives me internet and i can talk to you from six thousand miles away all all kind of boring things but my god the going to the congo just drills home how important institutional strength is and it is institutionally Mm. compromised you know, the just aren't, you know, the things that you or I take for granted, just the rule of law, you know, um, if I do dirty malpractice financially, you, you know, you can get away with it for a while, but you, there's ultimately, you're looking over your shoulder because, you know, the one day it's going to, it's going to catch up with mm-hmm. you. The terrible reality about the Congo is that, no, you can get away with murder forever. You buy the right people off, uh, you grease those palms, as you say, and, um, you know, we've had an incident where the prayer, the governor of the big province where all the mining is, a lot of money, uh, Moise Katimbi, was a rival, a political rival of uh, Joseph Kabila. And he was doing really well, this uh, Kabila guy. He was being really very powerful. And suddenly, bam, spurious political charges, politically generated, financial, irregular. He gets neutralized. Whereas he could have been a very good force, uh, potentially good force. But... Mm. The, the lesson I take from this experience is that a country that relies only on its leadership to define what that country is, is a weak country. If you let the elite, if you let the leadership elite dictate terms, then you're, you've lost. You've lost the game already. A country is as, is as strong as you and I. A country is as cohesive as you and I. And a country is as long lasting as you are. Do you, do you and I, and do you queue at the lights? And do you observe the red lights? Because the moment you don't, the whole thing spins. Mm. What was that thing? There's probably another thing from the wire about the broken window, the broken window downtown. If you don't, the broken window downtown leads to drugs and gangster work. Yes. Just a broken window. How does that work? Because the institutions can't be bothered to replace that window. Therefore, that tells you how responsible they are for funding the police properly and uh, investigations and mm-hmm. narco and blah, 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 blah. The Congo has been so pummeled by history, by events. People who live there are no different from you or I, but they do not see the power in coming together because it's never worked. So having, having to learn that lesson of coming together and cohesiveness has yet to happen and it's still a wild outlaw place where individuals can exploit that we- that central weakness and um, yes I follow it very closely without ever going there um, I'm fascinated I want to see it turn a corner I want this I'm just interested to see if the common decency of the people who help me will eventually prevail it's mm. a struggle um, it hasn't they haven't it doesn't prevail yet it will do one day, but it hasn't prevailed yet. James Robinson, uh, you know, co-author of Why Nations Fail, like the guy who, who wrote the book on um, inclusive and extractive institutions and ultimately, you know, the idea that institutions is everything. He has been a developmental economist consulting with the government, Democratic Congo, Congo for the longest time. And when I interviewed him, he said such a strange thing. He basically said, like, we don't necessarily understand corruption uh, in the West um, and that corruption isn't necessarily a bad thing. And um, I, I don't know, I found it such a bizarre 
It's such a bizarre take from this guy who wrote the book on how institutions is everything. Because was like that the guy? Saying, was that the book? Was that the book that was double byline? There was a Turkish name and then his. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and and Kologu or something like that. Yeah. Why did yep, you yep. fail? I've read it with interest, and interestingly, I laughed my little what's it's off because in the first few pages <laughs> he refers to an idealized society in the Congo the original Congolese community that was found by the Portuguese. And he paints a picture of this is how the developing world could have worked out. If only ever, everything had been as wonderful as San Salvador, which was the name that the Portuguese gave this small community of the Macongo people near the mouth of the river. It made me wet myself. I thought, how extraordinarily naive that you can accept an account by Portuguese colonial occupiers painting themselves as benevolent and positive of a of a paradisical society where they managed to balance out the travails of uh, the normal pressures of, uh, of African communities African rural communities tribal groupings and you you will accept that as an objective truth which is absolute baloney I thought it was hysterical um, but notwithstanding that he went on to make some nice points and I and I am I mean, fascinated a by book. I'm fascinated by the concept of nation and nationality and mm -hmm. the cohesive forces, the, 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 the contradiction between the centripetal forces and centrifugal forces. There's, you know, tr there's something we were talking about before we were recorded about patriotism and nationalism. They're very subtle margins between the two because, um, you know, the Congo, let me be honest, a bit like India, we were talking about as, as well. The Congo was never a nation in any meaningful way. Um, what we call the Congo today never, ever purported to be a single grouping, community, entity, call it what you will. It was never an imperial ambition. It was nothing. It was just too big. It was only, it's only been lassoed together because of the colonial ambitions of a bearded European king who never once went to Africa, who just said, I fancy a bit of land. And he said to his agents, go out there, I'll give you more gold the more land you get. So he, they did. And they just took the spit from the Atlantic to the Great Rift in the middle of the continent. And so there's no cohesive national sense to it whatsoever. Um, but as for the point about corruption, there are degrees. Take 5%, that leaves 95, right? 95 could still work. Take 10 leaves 90. Take 90, leaves 10. What do you grow out of 10? There's an old joke, and it goes like this, that a West African finance minister goes to Malaysia and is met at the airport in Kuala Lumpur and uh, leaves Kuala Lumpur International Airport on an eight-lane highway, brand new. And they sweep into town and go to a posh hotel. And as he's going along the eight-lane highway, the finance minister from Kuala Lumpur says, from Malaysia says to the Nigerian, to the West African. You see this eight-lane highway? He pats his back pocket. Cash, 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 cash. 10%. Two years later, there is another economic summit hosted this time in West Africa. And the Malaysian flies in and is met by his counterpart, who from the same story. And he meets him at Lagos Airport. And he goes outside and he goes down a single track road, two, two carriageways, one, one way each other, completely full of chaos and potholes and broken this and the other and the Nigerian points out the window and says do you see this eight lane highway and there ain't an eight lane highway there's nothing there he pats his pocket and says 100 percent so there the joke is it's degree if you take your golden goose and kill it to steal one egg you're going to have it won't lay anymore if you wait for it to lay an egg you can pass some of that and that is I guess the point he was making Tim, where did you hear that story? Because I have, uh, I have something potentially really, really interesting to say. Um, but who told you that I story? I can't remember. I often, when I do my Congo talk, I often refer to it, or indeed my West Africa talk, any talks, yeah. um, it comes up. I don't remember. Why? What, what, okay. what are you going to say? So I'm recording uh, the audio book for a fantastic book called Blood Bankers, which essentially was work from the investigative journalist Jim Henry, and it looks at the development crisis in the 80s and 90s, specifically in Latin America and the Philippines. 
and he opens up the chapter on Brazil, which has literally hundreds of examples of giant public infrastructure projects failing or being built and all of the proceeds going to a couple of pockets. And he has an exact same story. And it, is, and it, comes, from, it comes from a Brazilian official. So it's not like it comes from the white journalist who, you know, goes around the world telling this same story and just repurposing it. This came from a Brazilian and it was, you know, one minister flies in to see the other. He goes, hey, how did you get this really nice house? He goes, I'll show you. He takes a drive to a dam and says, you see that dam there? 50%. And then later on, the next one, they they travel to the next town and he's got an even nicer house. And then they go, hey, uh, how did you get all this nice stuff? And then they go for a drive and they point to a river and they say, you see that dam? 100%. No damn, I'm with you. That is I wonder, insane. I wonder. Well, it's crazy that it's the exact same <laughs> allegory spread across the two separate continents, you know? But to be honest, it is powerfully applicable. And mm. that is why, it, you know, it is in the Congo, the, ex- the extreme nature of the corruption. Oddly enough, Australia, um, Australia's wealthiest man, I don't know his name, wrote about him about six weeks ago. He has just signed a contract with the Congolese Who government. I don't know. Packer? Uh, mining guy. No. James mining Packer? guy. Chubby. G- G- no. Gina Chubby, Chubby guy. That's a woman. G- Chubby. The... Chub- no. Chubby guy with curly hair. Definitely male. Definitely not a woman. Uh, um, I don't know. Any, um, Clive Palmer? I, I, um, well, anyway, point is, super, super, wealthy Austra- super wealthy Australian has just signed a deal in the Congo. And he signed a deal for uni- uh, unique um, rights to develop the section of the river um, downstream from the capital. We haven't even touched on the river. The river is not a river. It's a force of nature. It's a it's an absolute vortex of power and Mother Nature flexing its muscles and showing you how cool, how cool Mother Nature can be. It is a ridiculous river. And in this one section of river, 45,000 tons of water go past a second. 45,000 tons. Wow. Sometimes it's 50, sometimes it's 40, but it averages 45 in the year. Every second, every second you've ever drawn breath. It has never dipped. It never dips. There's seasonal rains that hit, that will hit this river system somewhere because it spreads across both hemispheres, so the flow is constant. Anyway, if you could tap that hydroelectric power, you're sitting on the kind of answer to the to, to, to the human problem because you get green energy. You get non-impactful energy. You can take 30 gigs here, kilometer down, you can take another 30 gigs. It just flows. Mm-hmm. It's tantalizing, huh? I mean, isn't that extraordinary? Um, mm. The problem is they've known about this for 80 years. Um, uh, in the 1950s, American hydrologists were drawing up plans to exploit this as an asset, and they've never been able to deal with the corruption, the 100% problem we've just described. So in, yeah. in the 1960s, a, ca- a Canadian company put in a very, very small... Um, power station on the edge of this area and runs six turbines and then he, 10 years later Mobutu allowed uh, another one to be put in with eight so that's 14 turbines today one turbine turns one 13 are broken knackered no. easily to fix easy peasy lemon squeezy to fix can anyone get the pieces through the airport no can they get the permissions no can they get the lorry licenses to drive no can they get access no so if the government was remotely serious that would be solved in minutes few but there's one freaking turbine but the point is the water is still flowing and mm. it could generate 30 40 50 gigs of power at a fraction of the cost of the three gorges in china because you don't need to build a retaining dam mother nature's done it for you the mountains are there you just need to cap a tiny area and bam you're in suddenly you've got a guaranteed flow of steady water so this aussie has signed a, a, a deal it'll come to nothing there was a lot of publicity when it happened. But he has the same dream that Stanley had, that uh, Unilever brothers had when they went to the Congo for the, for the palm oil, that um, uh, the Oppenheimers did when they went for the diamonds, uh, that the cobalt engineers did, all of this stuff. Um, it's all so tantalizing because what is on offer is so potentially powerful open brackets, Mm. lucrative, close brackets. Mm. And yet, you know, you you talked about economics a second ago. The normal rules of economics do not apply here. You know, 
we've got our Keynesian model. We know that if uh, we drive up demand and there's economic activity, there's trickle down, there's taxes, right? Everyone, everyone benefits. They might not earn an enormous amount, but at least they've got disposable income. By spending it locally, that generates more and that generates more tax and blah, blah, blah. It's all wonderfully self-supporting. We know that Keynesian multiplier, that literally is um, Economics 101. Doesn't work in the Congo. Put in lots of money, it seeps out. Acceptable corruption? Bullshit, with the greatest respect to your interviewee. There isn't acceptable corruption. It leeches cash away from the system. That money doesn't leak, flow back in. There isn't a, a self-generating tax take. There's no uh, multiplier. Nothing. Nothing at all. Because there are these seams that are broken and it leaks out. Uh, into private bank accounts in Switzerland, offshore trusts, the normal dance. Mm. Isle, of, Isle of Man, British Virgin Islands, the whole thing. Mm. Panama Papers, when the Panama Papers came out, bam, there's the Congolese government and its senior figures. They have a fabulous section of the Panama Papers. You know, yeah. these people are well, they are so lucrative. It's so, the, the money that can be made if you run a, if you allow a Chinese company to run a mine out in the east of the country, but the money, that money doesn't go anywhere near the country. They don't bank mm. it in their own country. They certainly don't pay tax. They're not rich. Tax. There isn't an income tax. There's no tax authority. The, tax, yeah. the only tax in a country like the Congo is on choke points, which is stuff coming in and out of the country, right? So you, you tax stuff at the border, which makes international trade so problematic in Africa. It shouldn't be. It should be mm. brilliantly fast. But it's slow because that's the only way a government can guarantee an income ta uh, uh, tax income because the income tax that you're used to paying or that I'm used to paying doesn't apply because yeah. that's just... And just, one of the one of the unsung devils of this entire corruption story is the ease of which offshore is accessible and the ease of which financial and tax secrecy is accessible it's something that you know a flash in the pan comes the pandora papers the panama papers um but at the end of the day that's that's kind of the true cancer and all of the other ailments on the body are just consequences of that financial secrecy at the core of it. Because if, if it wasn't as easy to just re-divert foreign income into another place, you might actually get some of that trickle down, which is promised by I agree. I totally agree. And let me give you a little anecdote. Since COVID, where in the world have more world leaders died of the virus? Answer, Africa. There have been various prime ministers and presidents and plenty of senior ministers and senior civil servants who have croaked because of COVID. Do you know what's interesting about that? The most interesting thing for me is that these people wouldn't have died if the normal rules had applied because they're all used to getting public health care outside their country because it's seeped out of the country. Interesting. Right? So they fly okay. to Singapore, they fly to Malaysia, they fly to Chile, they fly to London, they fly to Paris, they fly to Brazil. That's the standard route. The dictator parks his money in London, has the flats in Knightsbridge, and he goes there when his prostate swells the size of an apple. When he gets COVID, he's expected, oh, I'm ill. I'm going to go there because, of course, I've taken all the money from the state, so there's no public health capacity in my country whatsoever. Mm. Holy shit, they won't let my flight plane take off. I can't land in London. <coughs> I die. And that replicated, I think there are five or six African leaders, and it's all... A tiny little vignette that proves exactly what you just said. The money leaks out. The locals' capacity suffers, whether it's healthcare, tax, banking, education, infrastructure. That, it, it's fatally compromised. It is drawn down because the leaders bank their money in the British Virgin Islands and do their shopping in Paris and go for their cosmetic surgery in Kuala Lumpur. And I just found that very, very interesting. Tim, that is such a fascinating anecdote. Um, it is so understandable to understand. No, that, that really is an amazing anecdote. I hope that it gets sort of picked up from one of these financial journalist writers and they can make that connection because that is a really, really good one. Um, you can make a lot of it. I mean, it, it's kind of, I wouldn't say that mainstream, but you know, there's a lot of chat about... Um, the corrosiveness of financial secrecy. Very popular books like Klepto Kleptocracy, uh, a year or two ago by Tim Burgess, um, you know, Billion Dollar Whale, Bradley Hope, Tom Wright, and then uh, Oliver Bolo. Uh, these are all your native comrades. Um, mm -hmm. 
writing money lands and stuff like that. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's becoming more noticed, something more people are paying attention to. But that specific anecdote there would just... I can see well, let, that being like a... Well, let me well give you another... Let me give you one little Australian anecdote that a mate... Of, uh, I was in... I met, I, met a, I met a former naval officer from Australia and he had retired from the Navy, but he had skills and he, he had repurposed himself and he's now the skipper of super yachts, which is a great skill to have. Have the skill, can drive your yacht into Monte Carlo, Saint-Tropez, or Antigua, wherever. Um, but it means he gets to, meet, to hang with extraordinary people. And sure. he's the, he, has, he has this sort of skill set that, you know, Paul Allen calls him up, Paul Allen's people call him up and say, can you drive Paul Allen's very large yacht, open brackets, the second largest in the world to Antigua. Who's Paul Allen? Founder of Microsoft. Um, oh, okay. With um, your man Gates. And uh, uh, you park it next to the biggest yacht in the world, which is also owned by Paul Allen. He bought the two largest at one point. It was a crazy, crazy one. And the point, the point of the story was Jeez, that, this guy, that this skipper has a skill set. And he worked on a particular yacht with a swiss billionaire who has a yacht and who charters it and one year week he gets the call fly to this place you are taking out the next clients and the next client was the president of the drc wow the president of the congo with an entourage and i can't because this is a public forum discuss what i was told about the behavior and the money and what went on but the bottom line is it makes boris's bring your own party white wine parties in Downing Street look slightly tame. Mm. It makes mm. Silvio Berlusconi's bonga bonga parties look quite tame. Wow. But the point, the point was, it was just another little proof that in a country that I touched on with poverty on a level that you cannot imagine, where you have 10 kids because you know six of them are going to die in the 21st century, you're rolling the same dice that, the peop that medieval Europe was doing. At the same time that that is true, the actuality on the ground in the Congo, the leaders are partying in a private jet, in a private yard. That's all you need to know. Mm. So trickle down economics, economic analysis, where nations fail. You, what I, I call it the, the illusion of normalcy. People are desperate to project normalcy onto a place it's illusion of normalcy i love the economist intelligence unit or the economist if you pick up a couple of the economist i love it because it's a great read it's very well read very beautifully written and uh, and they always offer a table at the back of gdp figures growth figures uh, you know um real wage growth all that sort of stuff and i love it because it's fabulous because you'll sometimes occasionally they do africa and there's drc and i love running my finger across these numbers because there they are, printed, you know, on a page, in a nice grid. And these are numbers. And let me tell you what relationship those numbers bear to reality. And that'll be none whatsoever. Really? But we're so desperate. We are so desperate to project normalcy onto a place which is so abnormal, like the Congo, that we will cut corners and say, well, actually, well, we'll just agglomerate this. Oh, we'll round it up, and who cares? And oh, it doesn't really matter. And I, um, I wonder if a lot of the shenanigans of corrupt leaders isn't camouflaged by that. They can exploit the fact that the world just, oh, we'll just make it all tidy. Ooh. Uh, and in crude terms, the reason dictators are allowed to exist is because the Western world says you can promise us stability, and we prefer stability to instability and we will mm. tolerate so saddam hussein was a good dictator for the 10 years he was fighting against the iranians he was our bitch he mm. was a bitch but he's our bitch he was killing iranians on the shat al-arab thank you very much in the 1980s we love him so much that doesn't stop him from being a dictator and a murderer and a vile leader and an anti-democrat gassing the kurds and uh, uh, draining the marsh uh, draining the marshes in the south but because he was fighting our enemies, he was our friend. When that war finishes, his character hasn't changed one iota. And I had a weird experience in 2003, I managed to get onto a yacht. Forgive me, I'm obsessed with private yachts. Um, a yacht that Saddam kept, his own private yacht, which was down in Basra. And it, to call it a yacht is wrong. It was like a cruise ship. It was insanely big. And it had been bombed to hell by the Americans. They'd, 
attacked it something like 16 times, had been hit in 16 different bombing raids, and it was burnt and battered, but it was still but floating. But it wasn't sunk. It oh wasn't sunk. Jesus. And I took a little boat out and clambered up a derrick that was hanging off, and there was diesel damage everywhere. It had been, the diesel had burnt, so everything was covered in that black soot. And I found why it's, it hadn't sunk. There was a plate there. It was made in Bremen by a fabulous German shipmaker. So it was a brilliant, it was a very, very, very impressive ship. But the other plaque that I saw was a dedication plaque. The ship was called El Mansur. It means victor in Arabic. And it was from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia to thank the great leader Saddam Hussein for his courage and steadfastness in the eternal fight against the Shia revolutionaries of Iran. Mm. And I just thought, hold on, Saudi, who were backing America, who have just bombed this, gave this thing to you. And that just shows you how you can, you can spin things around 180 degrees very, very quickly. Um, so uh, where were we? We were talking about nation states. It's my big, it's my big, it's my big issue. It's my big, it's my, it's probably going to think it's going to kill me, take me to my grave. But um, na nationhood, nation states, patriotism, the cohesiveness of community, the, the trade-off of individual interests, that is human history. And in the Congo, you see it laid bare in a rather tough way, but it, all you're seeing in the Congo is a reflection of the stuff that can happen elsewhere, not least in your own home country. It's my common theme through all of these adventures, and because, and, you know, I write books, some call them travel books. I hate it when it's just called a travel book. Yes, there's travel in it, but travel, hopefully, mm. is so much more. It's a bit of politics, a bit of adventure, a bit of excitement, a bit of geography, a bit of geology, a bit of mm. anecdotal, a bit of reportage, a bit of this and the other. It's, it's a whole range of things. But the common theme is this. It's about communities and individuals, the trade-off, creating a nation, a workable way of assembling people. And colonialism is very interesting because it was a moment when the world rebooted how societies were ordered. Society has been ordered for millennia in a certain way. Colonialism, because of the Industrial Revolution, bestowed upon a very few countries the ability to go out and kick ass and dominate. And they did. They went to Australia, Europeans went to Australia, and they destroyed an indigenous community. They went to America and it destroyed an indigenous community. They went to New Zealand and did the same thing. They went to South America and did, but had a slightly different relationship with the groups that they came from, the, Spain, the Spanish empire, the, the Spanish capital that they came from. They did. The British couldn't destroy India, so it massaged India, and it sent a very few colonial operatives to coerce and bribe the leadership of certain local potentates to then keep it all together. And I think the, the capitalist moment, the great industrial revolution changes everything in terms of building the nation state and leaves countries such as the Congo or Sierra Leone, Liberia, blah, 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 blah large swathes of Africa. They were taken over, but they couldn't be destroyed in the same way that the indigenous community of Australia, New Zealand and America was. So the indigenous community gets rewired, rebooted. And what you're seeing today is a reboot of how that society then post industrial revolution, capitalist involvement, um, colonial occupier creates. And whether or not that's a theme people want to listen to, you must make a think about, you, you can think about, but that's my, that's my theme. Mm. And no, they certainly will is, be, but that's a, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, you don't, it's, it's terrible to think about it, but you know, America, the land of the free, you know, just pause and think. Um, if there was one book I would recommend your readers consider reading if they haven't read, it's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. It's a history of America written from the perspective of the people who used to live there before the Europeans turned up. And it is an extraordinary story. Wounded Knee obviously is a battle. We all have this image filtered slightly through Hollywood, a little bit of history, perhaps a little bit of modernist, modernist stuff. But the relationship between those Europeans and the original um, the communities in North America is so fascinating and so problematic. There ain't anything remotely free 
and there ain't anything remotely democratic about it. So America, that's amazing. Brand, I'll definitely read that. Oh, I, ca- I cannot recommend it um, more mm. highly. It is extraordinary because it tells me that at the heart of the American model, now this isn't to criticize America, this is at the heart of the colonial mindset, there is a lie. And the lie is this. You, the insider, trust me. You'll be all right. Trust me. We'll sort you out. Trust me. And in Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, you hear lie a moment after it's their betrayal. But it's exactly the same that the British did in India, exactly that they did in Nigeria, that the Belgians did mm-hmm. in the Congo, that they did in Australia you know, um, and New Zealand. The Treaty of Waitangi, signed in 1840, the only treaty in the history of the world to create more fighting than it was meant to stop in New Zealand. There's a lie. Trust me. And the white outsider has a lot to answer for. So, so much of our history today, of our actuality, of our politics, is bequeathed by that. And we forget it. Now, Why Nations Fail, it's a wonderful book. I enjoyed it very much. I love the ideas. I love the concepts. But it felt to me as if it had lost a connection because it had missed the fundamental point, which is where the betrayal comes from. The, the sense of betrayal. Because if you betray, if you, send, if you show a model of betrayal and lying, then what's the elite that takes over from you going to do when they're going to betray and lie, right? You know, we have this image in India of Gandhi. Gandhi is a national hero. He was a national, he brought the nation together. Who killed Gandhi? An Indian nationalist killed Gandhi. An Indian nationalist killed Gandhi because Gandhi wasn't extreme enough in the eyes of the murderer. And the, most, the person who killed Gandhi wasn't a white colonial, oh, let's put this bad guy back in his box. He was killed by an Indian who represented the extreme form of what Gandhi represented. And there's that terrible truth about nationalism, which is that it is pr- there's a propensity to extremism. We haven't even come, on, it's come to Israel and Palestine. I lived there for four years. But Israel, the, 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 Zionist, the Zionist project is a fabulously justifiable project to give a home to the Jewish people. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It is fabulously justifiable, but it is unjustified when extremist fundamentalist measures are taken, which might be the destruction of communities, the murder of people, the breaking of international conventions, which is what the modern state of Israel does, whether it's, you know, by unilaterally declaring East Jerusalem the Israeli state in breach of international convention, or whether it's using white phosphorus over Gaza, which is in breach of what we know, blah, 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 blah. You know, it is justifiable, fantastically justifiable, but there is a propensity to it being taken by extremists. By extremists. And, I wonder, and I wonder if that is a model that doesn't apply. It, the, when I go to the Congo, we've talked richly and for me very engagingly, and I thank you for your interest in the book and the whole, the whole concept. But what I'm looking at is a country which has been chewed by a process. Outsiders came in and they chewed it up. And I'm looking at what's left. The physical space is beautiful. The river is amazing. Force of nature, cathedral trees, all those sorts of things. But what's the human agency there? The human agency has been corrupted. And that's what I find so intriguing. And it's what makes me read newspapers every day. It's that what, you know, I follow, you know, I think all human history is dealing with that exact same, the afterwash of, the, the, of, of those things. We'll have different tools, whether or not we're financial or economic or commercial or scientific to deal with them. But I try and fly my drone a little bit higher than all of them and just look down and say, what's the common feature? Is this what your currently working on because there's been a bit yes of and no. hiatus between books yes and no <laughs> yes i am <laughs> and uh it's kind of defeated me i've got lost in a certain way so i'm having to restructure okay. um okay, okay. but when i embarked on a on a history of the nation state uh i got lost in a forest the forest had no mm-hmm. there was no way out because it's just everywhere every single right. human interaction has been to a greater or lesser extent creation protection maintenance of a community of a nation state i mean what an extraordinarily ambitious uh question to ask though at least and try to answer yeah i I would 
yeah, I'd be thrilled to to schedule something like that and. Well, we can, can talk do, about we can we can talk. You can let's tell let's, me uh, things to read beforehand, so I might be able to. <laughs> it sounds uh, like you're pretty. No, you're bloody well read already. You've got you're, you're telling me books I didn't know about the kleptocracy um, uh, <laughs> issue. You ran through two or three titles there. I was going. Mm, well, I hope it doesn't ask me about those. Oh, I've got nothing to say. Um, but, oh, okay. Well, you got to do it. Perfect <laughs> financial secrecy stuff. <laughs> okay. One measurable index metric was in the 1940s. If you were a businessman from Europe, you invested money in the Congo in Africa. You didn't invest invested in South Africa. South Africa ended up being a very successful place with gold mining and other uh, uh, investments. But no, 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 no. It was a wild place, South Africa. Congo was settled and it had copper. And Europe and Japan were being rebuilt with copper. Every bloody house mm. needed a copper phone wire and a copper pipes for their plumbing. And where does copper come from? Uh, the Congo. Uh, the Cold yeah. War. The Cold War. Where did all those weapons, where did the weapons grade uranium come from? That made the yellow cake uranium come from that was refined to make those weapons? Uh, the Congo. We blew up Hiroshima and Nagasaki with Congolese uranium, processed Congolese uranium. All the uranium for the Manhattan Project in um, uh, New Mexico and Arizona came from the Congo. Um, and, 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 and. Um, that's mm -hmm. why it's, I find it, you know, if the normal rules applied, you and I wouldn't be sitting in Cape Town and Stockholm. I would be in Kinshasa and you would be in Goma and you would be living a fabulous life in a beautiful mountainous resort with lakes outside mm. and on the equator and weekends away. And I could, I could, we could meet Big up. Tuskers walking under. You could have your Tusk, your Tusker elephants walking in the horizon. You could be drinking your Tusker beer from Kenya and you could get in your car and pick up the modern or you're on your app on your phone and get the modern app version of the Lonely Planet Guide I described in the 1950s. And you could d drive west for 500 clicks and we and I could make him, I tell you what, we'll meet in Kisangani, you and I. No, well, let's meet in Bumba, it's only up the road. We'll meet in Bumba, let's go to Mobutu's old palace at Bad Badalite. Let's go there, we'll have a beer together. And you and I could drive there, meet in a restaurant, have a normal thing, go to an ATM machine, take, take stuff out of the, take money out of the, uh, uh, out of the machine, pay for our drinks. Uh, take photographs, upload them on the internet. All of these things, everything that I've just said, everything is perfectly reasonable. Reasonable to expect. Not one of them can be done. Mm. And that's, for me, what's so beguiling about the Congo. Since you've now made this uh, lovely alternative universe where we're both living in the glories of Africa, and it's super well developed and we can drive everywhere. I'd like to tell you about this anecdote that I have um, from a guy called Alexa Bermazovic, lovely Serbian man, works for a company called the Adrianople Group, and they're special, like, special economic zone consultants. And they have a massive project in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, and everything you just said without the hyper romantic idea of it with the big tuskers and perhaps the lovely waterfalls is uh happening there and so you have a ultra modern small little economic special economic zone in the middle of kigali uh that is producing uh phones that are made all from african products so it's african software hardware all the products come from africa it's like an african phone and many other things, Uber is working very well, restaurants are amazing, a lot of foreign imports. Um, it's like a tiny little-ish Western city in uh, you know, a landlocked country in Africa. And I just wanna ask you what you think about that, because clearly this question is on your mind, where special economic zones fit into it and whether that is like some sort of explanation for it's just policies fucked in all these other countries and the special economic zone got, got it just right and managed it because of its smaller population, because it's such a, you know, there's, there's less people, so there's less variables to go wrong. There's less chances to grease palms with corruption. Uh, jobs are guaranteed before it's all set up. They don't have to like organically come. So I don't know whether there's something in that you 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 can pick up on. But very happy to, very happy to give it a go. So Paul Collier in the Bottom Billion writes about SEZs and how they become his economic model is look at the world. There have been places of huge financial success that have been paradigms and they have spread and they've been replicated. And he's the one he mm. obsesses about is Singapore. Singapore, dirt poor 60 yeah. years ago, 50, uh, you know, 70 years ago, uh, malaria and uh, mango swamps. Now look at it. Insane. And 
it spread up the Malaysian Peninsula, and from there it spread into Indonesia and from Thailand, and, and you know, and it's that con the idea of a contagion, Kuwait, especially because of its own contagion, it spreads. Uh, and the question is, um, the assumption is that's a uh, objective, inexorable reality. Re replicate that in Africa, it will spread. Has been tried various places. They had free trade areas in Mombasa and in Djibouti, failed. Um, is being tried in Rwanda. What is the difference? Massively powerful, dictatorial regime. Financially, not very corrupt. Politically, exceptionally corrupt. If you're an opposition figure against Paul Kigali, you disappear in the middle of the night. You might flee the country, come to South Africa. Three of his senior spooks, intelligence officers, did. One was murdered about two years ago. One was murdered last year. And one had an attempted murder against him. Paul Kigali is a very powerful and popular figure in the West. But the reality is that he has the same brutal methodology of clinging on to power as Mobutu or Gaddafi or Charles Taylor. He's just more refined. So he has the ability to, to say, I dictate... As you well, probably well know, in Rwanda, there's a day a week where everyone goes out in tidies in Kigali, in the city. Everyone. Everyone goes out in tidies. And if you don't, the boys come round and knock you out of bed. And if you don't have an excuse, you get beaten up. So the streets of Kigali are exceptionally clean. But the question is, Hitler made the trains run on time, but having fast trains, having punctual trains, is that, is that the measure of your society? The streets of Kigali, I'm not, I'm not making a moral equivalence between Adolf Hitler and Paul Kagame. What I'm saying is that the behaviours of leaders can lead you, can lead sp uh, people and spaces in directions they, need not, they don't want to be taken. Now, what's going on in Rwanda? That's, as an example, in Kigali, I'm not aware of it. I'm blindsided. I don't know about that particular, but I could imagine it happening. And if it's going to happen anywhere in Africa, Kigali would be a very good place because you have a very strong authoritarian rule. They decide this is what we want. We want an African paradigm. It's got, we're going to create it. The test is, is it replicatable? Singapore was. The Djibouti, Mombasa, various projects, attempts around the coast of Africa have never, ever spread because the political leadership that was allowed them to happen didn't have the that couldn't let them spread because they need they needed to be organic they need to catch fire they need to oh mm. I, I like that so much we can do it here in Kuala Lumpur we can outdo the Singaporeans we can have bigger casinos let's build a bigger tower let's build Petronas towers um, the test of what you're talking about will not be in whether or not it, it in itself is successful in isolation the test will be is it replicated and I wonder if that's possible, given that it hasn't happened without the diktat and the fiat of an extraordinarily powerful leadership. I just think that, like, it works because it has had all of the economic necessities guaranteed beforehand, which is to say job security. To say that God jobs were there, it's an amazing point. That's an amazing, I caught that. When you said that, mm. I couldn't believe it. It's amazing. There will yeah, be like, jobs. Um, so that's, I mean, but, but it's, it's almost like guaranteed before it's built. And so there's a, a security in putting up all the local time investment or local risk trade off for potentially doing something else. And that's why it might work on a small scale. I think the question is then as you grow, as more people, and also a key, a, a key thing to note about the special economic zone is that it's, um, you know, it's not for everyone. You know, to, to get a job there, you have to have a certain level of education, which means in Zimbabwe, you come from a certain caste, which means you come from a certain amount of wealth, which means you in come Rwanda. from a certain amount of connections, all the rest. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then I think the, the problem of replicating it or doing it on a bigger scale just becomes as you add more variables to the mix, complexity can feasibly double with each additional variable. And going from 100 people to 101 people doesn't make it 1% harder. It makes it 100% harder. And then 102 is an, another 100% harder. And so if you try to replicate something that could feasibly work like Singapore, relatively small population, absolutely nothing going for it except, uh, you know, good 
good political economy, you can uh, not necessarily repl- replicate that in, say, Indonesia, where there's like 300 million people or something like true, that. Might true. Be yeah. Um, even though you could say, hey, but look, look at their... Um, Look at their geography. Look at their look at whatever they're predisposed with. Why couldn't they just replicate someone like that here? I think I think at least this is me again coming from a very unsophisticated uh, angle. But it's simply just a case of how much more complex and difficult things get as the group size gets bigger. You know, it's harder to organize fifteen people than fourteen, and it, sure. I think it can kind of simply just be drawn down to that. Um, but there's also an element of for me is that these things work if they are ground up. You know, if you start small and grow, imposing it from the outside is the wrong way round. Um, India, as a colonial project, was not a British colonial government plan, as you know. India was a bunch of freeboating mercenary capitalists called the East India Company. And for 300 years, they went out there and they took enough muskets and muscle to enforce in a tiny, this town, Pondicherry, this town, Madras, this town, Mumbai, and it grew. And when it got too big, they then called up the British government in 1856 after the Indian Mutiny, and the government turned up. What I'm saying is, start small and grow up. The idea, what you're telling me, you're telling me about a a beautiful laboratory experiment. It sounds like a laboratory experiment. But the best laboratory experiments are replicatable. That's what science is, mm. right? You can. Re- mm. d- doesn't matter where you do them on, you know, which side of the. In the southern hemisphere, Norman said, two o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the day, any scientist can do and replicate the thing. I wonder, I wonder if what you're describing um, can be, because it has to come from the ground. Um, and going back to my my the central theme, I'm wondering if my my view is that. Countries were made so big with envelopes around them by colonial powers. African countries were literally created. Nigeria, never a single entity at all, ever, created by the Brits in 1918. Congo, created by the Belgian king and then the Belgian state. It's so big, it's never had the chance to organic, you know, it's so oh, yeah. large to hold yeah, the whole together true. that the, the, the low, it, it doesn't, the small community, the, 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 the Joe Schmo on the ground can't grow up because there's something mm. powerful above it. And that's... Yeah, Kinshasa that's, has a low ceiling because it's within this much bigger Congo, which it has nothing to do with. Oh, absolutely. And there's, we haven't even talked about... Uh, we haven't um, even talked about the, dis- the disconnect between the city of Kinshasa and the rest of the country. But anyway, the point I'm making is that you're telling me something which sounds wonderful and admirable, but it sounds imposed from above rather than organically mm. growing. Mm. And the capitalist model... You know, the, the the Marxist, the alternative to the Marxist class war thing was always that individual groups solve a plan. So, yeah, the jobs in that industry go, all the coal mining jobs go, but it doesn't matter. Everyone rebrands as service sector tech, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly the old mining areas of the north of England are uh, people have got jobs again. You start, small, you can't, you can't impose it. Um, I have a personal antipathy for the Rwandan regime. I see them as a destabilizing force. The Congo, part of the fighting I was passing through, was directly encouraged, energized, supported by the regime of of, of, uh, Rwanda. They desperately wanted instability in Eastern Congo because it allowed them to send their mercenaries in to plunder gold and diamonds. Rwanda declares gold exports every year. The United Nations asked them, why do you declare hundreds of tons of gold going from Rwanda to Dubai when there isn't a single gold mine in your country? And they could not answer that question. Wow. So, but the world feels, the Western world feels guilty about the events of 1994. And so the Western world is not in the habit of telling the Rwandans how to behave themselves. And they will say, they'll roll over to Mr. Kagame. Well, I'll tell you one thing about Mr. Kagame. This is how extraordinarily ambitious and powerful the man is. He had a falling out with France, as you know. The French dared to suggest that the Rwandans were involved in the shooting down of the 
uh, the Tutsis were involved in the shooting down of the uh, juvenile Habyarana's plane in April of 1994, the act that precipitated the war. And this is a one of those historical scabs that never heals. The French accused Kagame. Kagame said, OK, France, even though you were never a French colonial power in my country, you were a French cultural influence. So we are a Francophone country. I'm having nothing to do with France. I dictate today that our language is going from French to English. I'm flipping the switch overnight. Every secondary school teacher must learn English to fluency and teach every subject in English. Not just teaching English, but teach geography and maths in English, mm. history, everything else. Could you imagine how ambitious you have to be? It's literally yeah. saying, I'm the dictator, I'm the dictator of Ruritania, we drive on the left-hand side of the road, but tomorrow we're going to drive on the right. But it's more ambitious than that, because it's a language. And do you know what? Mm. They've done it. Rwanda is yeah, in the... Is it, is it, is it actually is the, working? Yeah. Rwanda is in the Commonwealth. Wow. Rwandan runners are going to be running against Australian runners at the Commonwealth Games. Rwanda had that much to do with Britain in its colonial project. Mm. And yet two countries, Mozambique and Rwanda, have snuck into the Commonwealth. I never quite got to the bottom of why. I mean, the Commonwealth is about brotherhood of nations, and <laughs> nothing to do with... They don't like to explicitly acknowledge that it's a post-imperial construct to, to appease people. But... Um, Rwanda is in the British Commonwealth. Hold on. It's because their mm. hatred of the regime directed towards France is so intense, they want to have nothing to do with it. Mm. Anyway, the anecdote got... of the gold uh, is just another crazy, wild, egregious show of strength and corruption that y you, you would only see from a satirical villain in a movie yeah, exactly um but it's but it's i don't real. mind That's i don't mind not having insane. any gold mines gold mines but i'm going to declare you know yeah, yeah, why internet. declare it that's the thing it's like it's it's just insane um but it, look tim you have to go and uh like i said to you before i have I have also an equal amount of questions more about you. And so I'm hoping maybe we'll get another chance and we can do one. Well, you're going to have a miserable time editing this two and a half hour um, thing, but enjoy it. Uh, and uh, uh, I look forward to the final cut, as it were, the, uh, the silk purse out of the sow's ear. Um, and if you felt that you wanted to talk some more or you get reader feedback from your or viewer feedback that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. But before you leave, we have to leave on a high note. And so I want to ask you what a country is that you're most bullish on. So we've spoken a lot about the depravity of uh, many countries. What about a country that you think has just a most terrific future ahead of it? <laughs> that is a brilliant uh, question for... Um Cutting me dead in my tracks. I tell you what, a country that I hope will have an amazing future, which are the two countries in, well, basically all of the Yugoslav countries. If they can just stop that eternal issue about nationalism and chauvinism, you've got places of Croatia, Slovenia, and uh, Bosnia in particular. Uh, they are the most beautiful places I've ever been. If I, if I could live anywhere in the world that it wasn't Cape Town, it would be on the, the coast, the Adriatic coast of Croatia. Um, and I, th the talent of the people, the physical location, Europe, but the nicer part of Europe, the Europe where you're not getting snowed on like you are <laughs> in Stockholm for nine months a year. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I would be hopeful about that. Um, and let me be honest, what I'm optimistic about is that, uh, in any country, you find extraordinary people. It's just the, the few, the elite, that we allow to dictate terms. So is Russia Putin and his cronies? It's not. I know plenty of Russians. The scale of the place, how could you possibly boil it down to just a few cronies? Is South Africa just a dodgy, corrupt government, Jacob Zuma stealing everything? No, because I live here. I know amazing people. So I'm optimistic that good will prevail, uh, not, in, in, not in any particular country, but I'm optimistic that, you know, there's enough good in all of us. But in order for that good to, to prevail, we have to recognize where we've gone wrong. And that's why the Congo is, and some of the journeys I've made, that's really why I do it. To try and recognize our missteps and our muddles and our confusions. And so that we could all move in a better, better direction. Well, amazing, Tim. Uh, been a true pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, 
also amazing work on the book. It's such an extraordinary modern day modern day tale of adventure. Thank you, it's thank you for your enthusiasm, and I hope your uh, your listeners have enjoyed our conversation. I certainly have. Cheers, cheers. Well, I hope you all saw what I meant by some people being predisposed for podcasting. That was a standout episode for me for sure, but it's just the case as I'm you know, doing more of these podcasts, you sort of realize that some people just make better guests than others, but not, not because of their capacity or their work or their interest or anything like that, just their ability to speak. Tim and I spoke a little bit before and after the recording and it's just the exact same there. He was giving me this very beautiful sort of succinct analysis of why cricket unifies what nothing else could in India. And anyway, really interesting. But thank you. You're a very generous person for still being around. I assume you enjoyed it unless there is masochistic tendencies to you, in which case, absolutely welcome. But my ambition is to corner the podcast market with this show for eclectic curiosities in whatever country it is you're listening in from. So obviously this episode was with Tim Butcher about the Congo. The last episode was with, with Marcel Van Oosten about Dutch photography. The next one's going to be about NFTs with Danny Miranda. So look, it's got a wide and varied interest. I understand not all episodes will be for you, but especially if this is the first time you're listening, subscribe to the podcast. But more importantly, leave a review. The uh, algorithms and the podcast distributions are in the Stone Age. They are beyond terrible at discovery. So I listen to my podcast on thing called Good Pods. You can rate and review each episode. You likely are mostly listening on Spotify or Apple. If it's Spotify, go to the show, follow it, and leave that five juicy five-star review. If it's Apple Podcasts, go to it, subscribe to it, leave that five stars, and then also say something very complimentary and nice about the show. I know it's a lot to ask, but truly, it is the best thing you can do for me. If you can manage it, I would appreciate it very greatly. And then go a step further and get your kids, get your boyfriend, get your girlfriend, get your mates, get everyone you see on the street, pull them over and subscribe to the show and pull five stars in. That's all from me. Thank you so much. You're a legend. This was a great episode. Ciao.